Welcome, my friends, my family, my fellow gamers. This is your boy Porter Rock seventy seven back at you with a live stream? All right. Um, if you're new to the channel, uh, welcome aboard. I hope you enjoy the content that I'm about to show today. And for all my returning family and friends and fellow gamers, thank you so much for rocking now. Thank you so much for showing up. I truly appreciate you guys taking time out of your day to rock out with me live. We could talk some gaming. Um, of course, I'm here to preach and provide the gospel. All right. But um, damn, uh, I hope everybody, um, if I haven't said it before, I hope everybody had a safe holiday season. Um, I hope you were able to enjoy your time with friends and family. Um, and if things didn't work out so well, I hope at, at the very least um, you're safe and um, hopefully, you know, 2020 will be the better year for everybody. You know, even if you had a successful 2019, always strive for more, always strive to be better. All right. So um, really appreciate everybody up in here. Shout out to the chat. Uh, I see some old faces coming back. Haven't been seen in a while. My man, Mark Woodland, uh, it's good to see you back. Um, I'm glad to hear that you and your kids had a great holiday season. Vedra, uh, thanks for rocking out. My man, Mad was out there. What's up? Young boy, what's good? Overdone. My man with the crazy memes. Ice Queen Gaming, what's up? Man, what's up, girl? Appreciate you, uh, stopping by. Uh, Luis Esteban, you know what I'm saying? What's going on, brother? Um, you know, D.I.O. Marty Spartan was good. He's out there killing it on Twitter. And stuff like that. Uh, Bob Pound Max. What's going on? What's up? Uh, who else we got here? We got King up in here. Julian Molina. What's up? Uh, my man said cancel PS5 pre-order. My man. Listen, Julian. You know you have bad taste in games. So you will never get in the PlayStation. Uh, Honey Lizbeth. Uh, first time I see that name. Uh, apologize if you've been on before. But if this is new and your first time. Welcome. Appreciate it. Plus Ultra was good. Eon. Robert McCloud, always been around. Uh, we got Daniel, what's up? Luke, was good? And Casta. You know, Cassie Cage, what's up, girl? It's been a while. Um, damn, everybody, you know, Daniel, what's up? Josh, flipping, you know. Um, while y'all here, hit the like button. And, of course, um, uh, if you don't mind, uh, retweeting it. You know, post the link through your favorite form of social media. Most likely it's Twitter because we're all up in there enjoying the mess, enjoying the console war mess, the trash talking. We know we love it. We love the trash talking, all right? Um, but if you have Facebook and all that stuff, by all means, you know, get people involved. Let's get the chat going. Um, I love the family. I love the chat. I love you guys. Uh, it's, it's probably the best chat out on YouTube, and I'm glad you guys are out here doing your thing, all right? Um, with that, you know what I'm saying? So let me show you something, all right? And it's this right here, right? Pretty simple, right? Um, PS5 logo. You know, nothing special. Um, still follow along the same line of every other PlayStation logo. Nothing unique, nothing intuitive. Um, nothing special about it. Really, there's nothing special about it. I mean, we pretty much knew. We pretty much know what every other symbol is going to look like. No reinventing the wheel. You know? It's like a set of tires. They work. You know? Got summer tires for the summer. Got winter tires for the winter. You know, all weather. It is just... It is what it is. There's nothing unique. Nothing crazy. It's just a symbol, right? So why... So why... All the craziness, you know. Of course, there's a mixture of trolling, you know. You know, trolling is always the fuel that gets added to the fire to make the internet blow up, right? The trolling and the shit talking, you know, it's it's it's, it's all healthy. I mean, it's nothing. It's nothing bad. Like no one's no one's getting assassinated or any weird stuff like that, right? Of course, you know, people troll, they're using Instagram, they're using social media hype behind the symbol to trigger fanboys, trigger console warriors, you know, just all that stuff. But why? Why is it a big deal? In reality, why did the symbol get so many likes when it's just a symbol? It's nothing crazy. I mean, you even see jokes, you know, of even from media cracking jokes be like, oh my God, you know, Sony just unveiled, you know, the most intuitive logo ever, you know? It's simple, 
Okay. Uh, but what's the meaning behind it? What's the meaning behind the excitement? All right. And simply put, the symbol represents quality. It represents an established brand. It, it, you know, when it comes to consoles, it's consistency. All right. That's all it is, you know. Um, and that's how, and everybody can relate to a symbol. Everybody can relate to a, a logo that's consistent, right? And it's not just gaming, it's, it's everywhere, right? Look at it, for example, um, Superman. When you see, or when you see the bat symbol, you know, one of my things is the bat symbol. You know, everybody knows what it stands for, right? When you see the Spider Man symbol, um, you know, even Xbox. When they had the little emoji of Scorpio emoji, you know, it's a representation of something, right? It's a representation, you know, in this case of a brand that's, I think at this point we could all say has been the most dominant console brand, right? And I, and I specifically say console because Sony hasn't done, a, a, not a, let's be honest, they haven't done a good job in handhelds at all. Let's just be honest, right? That's not their thing, right? And I think... Not think, but recently, about a month ago, Jim Ryan said they have no plans for a handheld. With good reason. They just haven't been able to crack that nut, right? What's up, Big Cloud Gaming? What's going on? You know, Craig, what's up, everybody? Thank you for rocking out, right? The symbol represents the most dominant brand in gaming, right? Every generation since PS1, PlayStation has been a top performer. I think PS3 was probably their weakest that they weakest generation they ever had in console gaming. And yet that generation still resulted in 80 plus million consoles, which is great. You know, maybe not great as compared to PS2, but great overall in gaming. And once again, it sold a billion games, which no other platform other than PlayStation has been able to do for consoles, right? Nintendo hasn't been able to do it. Microsoft hasn't been able to do it with the Xbox. It's just PlayStation consistently Three, in fact, three consecutive generations, and we'll talk about this one, where they sold more than a billion games, you know. So when Sony introduced, you know, when Sony says, hey, this is the PlayStation 5 symbol, you know, uh, it's information that even reaches the casuals. You know, a simple symbol, right, that's telling the world, hey, PlayStation 5 is coming, and people relate that symbol to the quality, to the things that they enjoyed when they played PlayStation 1, PlayStation 2, PlayStation 3, and many people who are enjoying PlayStation 4. It's all tied to that symbol. That's all it is. And that's why it's receiving a lot of likes, social media. It's a simple thing, a simple information. It's just simple feedback to Sony saying, hell yeah, we ready for PlayStation 5. That's, that's all it is. What I don't understand is how some people don't get that. Especially like the Xbox guys. Because literally the X is your symbol. That's literally the Xbox symbol is X. In fact, the first Xbox OG Xbox, the top part was an X. You know what I'm saying? It, it, that's what it is. It's, it's, it's symbol, right? That's why Microsoft keeps using the X as part of the Xbox thing. Xbox Series X, Xbox One X. X is a key symbol, you know, key letter to association to the brand. The problem is the X has its highs and lows. And this generation has been a low point um, for the brand, you know. So Xbox Series X has a lot of excitement among the fans of Xbox, the people who like Xbox, the people who enjoy Xbox. And there's nothing wrong. If you're a fan of Xbox, then it is what it is. It does, you enjoy your brand. So you're excited seeing the information. You're excited seeing the things that Microsoft's coming. You love the way, you know, the console reveal, the little bits of information, and you're looking forward to more. That's your brand. That's what you got. But you got to remember, the Xbox is not a global brand. It's not loved all across the world. The majority of console gamers don't play on Xbox. So in order to get a bigger mind shell, in order to go after the bigger market, Xbox has a lot to prove. Microsoft has a lot to prove. Xbox making all the moves, and those moves are appreciated among the Xbox community. But outside of that, it's got a lot of ground to gain. But on the flip side, PlayStation, it got, it captured majority of the market when it comes to console. Stuart Stokes, sometimes simple is best. Throwing too much unnecessary additives is bound to cause confusion for casuals or newcomer. I, I agree with that, you know. 
back to what I was saying with PlayStation 5, you know, it's captured majority of the console market. Captured a lot of positive uh, social media, positive outlook. Just the all round PlayStation 4 has just been one big, you know, blowout right here. And now, and I will segue into this right here. This will be my segue, right? These stats don't lie. This is facts. This is not, and, and people could look at this. This is what I'm showing you right now. It has nothing to do with trolling. Um, simply was good. Salty is gaming. Uh, thank you for rocking out, man. Uh, appreciate it. Right. This information in reality is not trolling. I mean, it can be taken for trolling. Yes. Do trolls, PlayStation trolls use this image that you're seeing right here, right? All of this to talk trash, throw it in Xbox face, you know, Xbox fanboys face, of course. But in reality, none of this has anything to do with the gamers to make fun of, right? What you see here is an achievement by the PlayStation gamer in terms of, you know, themselves or of, or something to be thrown in the face of an Xbox gamer. It, it, it's really, it's just, some people are just sensitive for no reason. In reality, why is an Xbox gamer or PC gamer or Nintendo gamer um, sensitive to any of this information? Like, if it's just numbers and stuff like that, right? But these numbers are facts. All these numbers that you see here, they're facts. They're not lies. You know, there's all truthful information. The question, and I get these a lot from, um, uh, from Twitter. Uh, they come and tell me, why do you care? Of course, you know, you got the trolls that, that will come after me be like, oh, so you catch a check? When are you going to buy your new Mercedes, right? Those are the trolls that try to make a point. Obviously, you know, there's no harm in joking around and talking trash, right? And then there's the people who seriously ask me the question. Like, Porter, no, for real, why do you care? And I'm going to explain it. Because explain it on Twitter. Let's all be honest. We've all been on Twitter. Some of these dudes can't read. So even if you try to explain it to them, it's like trying to explain something. It's like trying to have an adult conversation with a seven-year-old. It's not going to happen. It's just, it's just no point, all right? At that point, you just be like, go to your room. You know what I'm saying? That's what I'm saying. Go, go to your room. Play with your toys. Like, we're not going to have an adult conversation. You're seven years old. You're, you're, you know, in 10 years, come back when you're older. You know, it just feels like you're talking to kids, even when you honestly try to talk to them. That's why most of the time I'm joking and I just troll and, on Twitter because it's really – if you really try to have honest conversation on Twitter, you're going to you're gonna, you're gonna go crazy. So just have fun and deal with it. But here I can explain and be honest and whatever, right? So why for me, especially since I – have a YouTube channel and I talk gaming, right? So it's pretty important. Why am I interested in these numbers, right? Okay. The reality is I'll give you one word, right? And if you've been gaming a long time, right? And you've been gaming around the block, right? And you got a lot of consoles, then this one word should clear on why I track sales, why game sales are important, console sales are important, all that stuff. One word, just one word. And that will, and then you'll be like, oh yeah, you're right. You're right, Porter Rock. Now, now we get it. Just one word, right? And that one word, Sega. Do I really need to go into detail now on why sales is important? One word, Sega. Now, if you haven't been gaming for a long time, let's say you started PS1, PS2, Maybe 360, you know, that's not an issue. You know what I'm saying? Because in order to gain, you know, to, in order to go back to the days of Super Nintendo, Nintendo, you have to be an old motherfucker like me. You got to be old, right? You got to be an old dude. You're not going to be nine years old and be like, oh, yeah, my first console was a Nintendo. No, it wasn't. Stop lying. Unless you're talking about the Nintendo Wii or something, right? <laughs> you know? So you have to be around the block to understand the word Sega, right? So why the world Sega for those who haven't been around the block? For those of you that's PlayStation 1, PlayStation 2, wherever gamers or stuff like that, okay? So Sega was my preferred platform around the gaming time, right? It wasn't my first console. My first console was actually a ColecoVision, right? But I had the Sega Master System. I had the Nintendo, uh, the Nintendo Entertainment System. I had the Super NES. 
I had N64, Genesis, love the Sega Genesis, Saturn, Dreamcast, but I was more partial to Sega. Sega was my preferred platform, right? For many reasons. Altered Beast Shinobi, I was a huge Shinobi fan, right? Fantasy Star, Shining in the Darkness, which eventually became Shining Force, Vector Man, um... Uh, What's that game? It started with a kid or something that you would change a hat or mask. There was like a hundred masks and would give you a different abilities. Um, I'm talking Sega was just pushing out IPs. That was just insane. Right? Sega, during the Genesis Super Nintendo, the definitive sports um, uh, console. By far, definitive sports console. Now, most of you... Now might look at sports like oh okay big deal sports but back then sports was huge all right I mean sports is huge now whatever but Kid Chameleon my man my man good good yo shout out man my man got it Kid Chameleon bro tell me that tell me that game wasn't fire oh my man Kid Chameleon got out there shout out to the chat that's why I love you guys bro They're like this chat has true knowledge and stuff like that right oh um, damn what else. Mortal Kombat, right? When Mortal Kombat came out, the Sega Genesis version was the one that was the adult version. Had all the blood, the actual or fatalities. Nintendo stripped it, right? But that was one of the big appeal of Mortal Kombat at that time, right? Because that was different, right? Um, it's crazy, right? What else was out there? Sonic, of course, right? Even though Mario's dope, Final Fantasy's dope. Nintendo, that's not for nothing. Nintendo had great games. But back to sports... Sports was huge back then because there was no really online multiplayer. It was a lot of couch co-op. It was, it was the age of couch co-op and competition, right? Sega Genesis had all the fucking competitive, excuse my language, competitive sports games. Uh, they had Buster Douglas Boxing. The graphics was insane. Tommy Lasorda Baseball. Madden, right? Before, you know, the NFL contract, Madden started on Genesis. And then later on, it went on to Nintendo, and it was a terrible version. But Genesis with Madden, uh, Lakers versus Celtics NBA playoffs. It was just a lot of competitive stuff, right, on there. Uh, an amazing brand, all right, for the most part, an amazing brand. Sega put mad effort into their games, into their consoles, constantly putting IPs. You know, Streets of Rage, oh, yeah. It was just... It was just a lot of games, you know, and then there were, and then they also got like, you know, a lot of great third party support with Strider, Ghouls and Ghosts. It was just, it was an amazing platform. Sega Genesis was an amazing platform and it, and it just continued on, right? Sega always tried to push the envelope. Dreamcast, right? The 2K sports on Dreamcast, 2K football, 2K basketball, Sega Net. Man, you know. Sega was just on it, man. I love their consoles. I love their games. And I didn't pay attention to the sales. I didn't pay attention. I didn't start paying attention to the industry from that perspective. And I said this plenty of times, haven't said it in a long time, until the PS1 gen went in 64. That's when I started paying attention to sales, right? And it's because, again, before that, I didn't pay attention to the sales or whatever. Like, well, like the stuff that people are saying now, just game, don't worry about sales and just enjoy it. I was like that, you know, not saying that I don't enjoy gaming. I love gaming, but I'm smarter on what I choose and pick in gaming as compared to what I was back then. Because back then I used to just get everything. Turbo Graphics 16, other than the super expensive platforms like Philips CDI and Neo Geo. But I had Turbo Graphics 16 and stuff. Sega CD, you know, Turbo Graphics CD. All the Nintendo platform consoles, every Sega console, you know, you just game. Had the bazooka, U Force, Power Glove, the trackpad for the Olympic Games, Sega 3D glasses with the in the light gun, light gun on both platforms because I had the Nintendo light gun. I had it all. I even had this device that you would put on Sega Genesis. So you could play the master Sega Master System games and make it backwards compatible. You know? And even on the Sega Master System, Space Harrier, The Ninja, Wonder Boy. You know? On Genesis, Last Battle, love Last Battle. I played that game to ad, uh, ad nauseum, right? Right? I had all these games 
You know, when I was younger, obviously, my parents would buy it for me or use my allowance as I got older, had summer jobs, bought my own stuff. Then as I became an adult, bought my own stuff all outright. I enjoyed all that stuff. But what I noticed when I bought all this stuff, they weren't making no games. Bought a Sega CD, right? It was, I remember it was $2.99, actually, right? Or $1.99. It was expensive. And my dad bought it for me, right? He was pissed, but he bought it for me, right? Right? And I was happy... And then the first couple of months, great, but no games. Like, there was, they were not making games. And I'm like, you know, the Sega CD is dope. You know, the audio is dope, all this stuff. You know, full motion movies and stuff. Not making games. Bought the bazooka for Nintendo. Oh, man, that was so dope when I saw the commercial. It was like a robot fighting game and you're shooting. You know, it's it like taking light gun gaming to the next level. With the targeting system, I'm like, oh, hell yeah. Bought that sucker. No games. No games. Not making no games. Topographic 16 started out. Lots of exclusives. Bonk. Splatterhouse. I was like, man, this is all dope. Then out of the blue, Harley. The Super Scope. Yeah, that's what it's called. Harley no games. Rob the robot I had. You see him in the commercial playing with you, Super Mario. He ain't do that shit. And no games. I mean, man, can you, you know, at least play Double Dragon? Do something, Rob. He ain't do nothing. 32X, I got that too. 32X graphics before 32X systems even came out. I was like, oh, snap. All I got to do is buy a little attachment and get graphics. Had that too. Yeah, no games. No, are we seeing a trend here, right? So over time, when you look back, because we have the knowledge now, Sega invested a lot of stuff. And it wasn't selling, and they weren't selling games. You know? It was obvious the company was going to stop making consoles, and they weren't going to push out new IPs anymore. They were going broke. They weren't selling anything. From my perspective, Sega was the shit, from my perspective. All the games and things I'm mentioning were dope. It was fantastic. You know, I was oblivious to the industry. I was oblivious to console sales, market share. You know, obviously we knew about console war, but it was mostly trash talking on TV. Genesis does. Can't do this on Nintendo. Then I would just talk trash to Nintendo guys. But that's about it. I didn't really know about monthly console sales or monthly game sales or profit or third party profit. I didn't know any about that stuff. Nobody did. All I knew is, man, this looks dope. I'm going to get it. And then when I got it, 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 no games. Right? And it didn't dawn on me. Who the hell is going to make games on products that don't sell? Sega CD did not sell well. So why would a developer make games? And Sega can only make so much. Especially, here's the crazy part. Right? When you think about it. Sega created a device that takes away from the Genesis. Because if their first party studios are making CD games, then they're not making cartridge games for the console. When you think about it, right? Think about it. At the time, I didn't think about that. All oh, that's all oh, Sega CD, I love Sega. Full motion video, games on CD, it's gonna be dope. Oh, hell yeah, I'm buying it. It didn't dawn on me. That a lot of companies are going to be like, hell no, we're not making games for Sega CD because the user base on the Genesis is bigger. 32X, same thing. Why are they going to make 32X specific games when, you know, the majority of the fan base is on the base Genesis? They're not going to make an exclusive for 32X. They're not going to make exclusive for Sega CD. Sales! If I knew then what I knew now, I would have not wasted my time on the 32X. I would have not wasted my time on Sega CD. I would have not bought the bazooka. They had no games. It was literally collecting dust. I was willing to play it, but you can't play something if you don't get games. And you don't get games if it doesn't sell. I didn't know that. I know that now. It's obvious now. You understand? Know That's why sales are important. You know, because in the end, the developers, the publishers, right, to a certain point, yes, they want power. They want, you know, stuff like that. Right. As long as they get 
the specs they need to push the games and the tools and the stuff they got, they're good. But it's not charity. I promise you, these developers are not making these games because it makes your heart happy. They don't go to bed at night saying to themselves, man, I wonder if these dudes played my game and having a great life right now. No. They got mortgages. They got rent. You know, they want to buy consoles and games themselves. They go to movies. They got to buy sneakers, clothes. They go on vacations. They got a life. This is their job. I don't think we all, I think a lot of people forget. Game developers are working a job, a career. They get paid, and that salary contributes to their lifestyle. Whether they put their kids in private school, depending, you know, if you're a big publisher wig, buy a car, insurance, all the stuff a lot of us are dealing with day to day with our job. That's what game developers are doing. That's what publishers are doing. It's a job. They need to make money to sustain their lifestyle, make profit, do bigger, all that stuff, right? And they're not going to just do things for charity. If something don't sell, if this device don't sell, if this device don't sell games, they're not going to make games for it. You're not going to get the games, right? It is what it is, you know? That's the reality, you know? If you prefer or have a, a, a brand and you enjoy a brand, sales is important to the brand. No sales, the brand is dying. No game sales, the brand is dying. Plain and simple. Sales are important, especially if you like this brand, you like this console, you like Nintendo, you want Nintendo to sell good. Like the Switch owners. The Switch owners have no worries that Nintendo's going to disappear or stop making games on console, okay? They bounce back. Switch is very successful, you know? Of course, Wii U wasn't so great, whatever, but it was enough for them to say, hey, we still got what we got. We can still make another product, and that product shined, the Switch. Lots of sales. They're going to get lots of games. They have no worries, right? Sega wasn't like that. Sega had way too many. Like a company could have a bad year, a bad gen even, right? Even a terrible gen, right? You just can't have it consistently. And Sega overall was having a lot of bad generations. I think Genesis was really their only successful generation. But it got completely erased and negated with Saturn, Game Gear, all those third party, all those aftermarket peripherals that just failed, 32X, Sega CD, the 3D glasses. It's just a lot of stuff that Sega tried to do, and it just didn't work. It overshadowed the actual base Genesis success, you know? You know, it's just crazy, you know? And with Dreamcast, great console... But I had to go against the hype of the PlayStation 2. I mean, PlayStation 1 just knocked it out the box with 100 million sales. First console to ever sell 100 million. Knocked it out the box. Dreamcast had to go head-to-head -head with that. But if that if that wasn't bad enough, and I don't know if many of you remember, EA bounced on Sega. They said, you know what? You know, EA did not like the moves Sega was making with their 2K series. So EA said, fine. We're not going to make games on this platform no more. Not just sports, any game. EA pulled out everything, and they made the sports games exclusive to PlayStation 2 up until Xbox and Nintendo came around later. But things like Madden and NBA Live, which were huge games, they were exclusive to PlayStation. PlayStation 2 up until, you know, Xbox and Nintendo came around, right? That hurt Dreamcast also. When people started hearing that a big third-party corporation pulled out of supporting the console, a lot of people attributed that with, man, this console must be dying then if EA doesn't want to make games from it. It just added a bad stigma, sadly. And that wasn't the case. The reason why EA pulled was just simply EA did not like the 2K series. Sega was doing a great job with 2K basketball and 2K football. That was not in the best interest for EA. EA wanted, you know, the sports market to themselves, and they wanted the sports market to themselves on Dreamcast. Sega wasn't hearing it. 
In fact, the 2K series was the studio that developed the 2K games was owned by Sega. Sega eventually sold it in 2005 to Take Two. You know, but those were Sega Studios, those sports games, right? That's what happened. It wasn't, but that just attributed it, and then it just went spiral downhill. And that's all attributed to sales. That's just it. No damage control, no fanboying, no talking trash. Doesn't matter what product you like. The sell of the product, the games it needs to sell, that's an important factor for the brand you prefer and the success. Now, if you look at all of this right here, right? All of this. This is consistency with the PlayStation brand. Already 100 million sold, 106 million to be specific, right? You're talking PlayStation 1 over 100 million, PlayStation 2, 150 million. PlayStation 3 was around 87 million now. That's the last count, right? That's bad for Sony. Think about that. 87 million is down. Insane, right? Anybody else that's great and that's successful, but for PlayStation, oh man, you really screwed up, right? Back to 106, right? The most important metric, 101 billion, 1.15 billion. 1 billion, 150 million sales of software. That's a lot of games people are buying. And that's not just great for Sony, that's just great for the industry. Because the majority of those games are from third party. Indie developers, big third parties, double A, single A's, and everything in between all around the world. That, that, those are games being sold across the board. You know, PlayStation games are out there buying the games. Over a billion, right? And if you do the math, PlayStation 2, they have 150 billion. So that's the record, 150 billion, right? PlayStation 4 is only 350 million away from reaching that mark. And the year just started. The year just started. And you got a lot of big titles, not just from Sony, you know, from PlayStation First Party, like The Last of Us, Ghost of Tsushima, right? You know? But from third party too, Cyberpunk, of course you're going to get your annual Call of Duty, right? As always and stuff, right? Whatever big title EA releases, you know, you get all that stuff. So PlayStation 4 is poised to completely eclipse 1.5 billion. But now I will say this. PlayStation 2's 1.5 billion I think will always be the most impressive because it's straight disc. PlayStation 2 had no digital, right? So you had to constantly go out to the stores. And then also at that time you didn't have big things like Amazon where they deliver games to you in two days or whatever. We didn't have that. You most for the most part had to go out to the store and buy the games, right? Maybe there's some delivery services but in that time it wasn't as big as it is now. Now, it's easy. You got apps. Hell, you go through your phone. Yep, yeah, I'm buying it. I'm buying it. It's real quick and easy. And then the digital store, you know, back in those days of PS2 games, you could go to a launch and the game sold out that day. That's where the whole pre-order started, if you guys remember, right? If you've been gaming a while, right? Pre-orders and all this stuff that we do now, right? That all began because pre-order was a necessary tool for lack of a better word a necessary thing you had to do because you might not get the game when it launched that week so when they announced i remember my first lesson for pre-order right because i never used to pre-order because i always used to get the game until metal gear solid 3 came out that was the first time i couldn't get my game the launch day right so I went up to GameStop, went in there, be like, hey, let me get MSG3, you know, and they'd be like, oh, yeah, uh, what's your pre-order? I'm like, oh, I didn't pre-order. They had stacks of this shit, right? Stacks of Metal Gear Solid 3 games behind them, right? You could play Minecraft before Minecraft was even known. You could build Trump Towers with the amount of Metal Gear Solid 3 stuff there. It was crazy. They couldn't even put it on the shelf. They just literally stacked it on the floor, ceiling high. It was all around them. Like, the dudes were walking around the game. Some of them would knock it down like if it was a Lego set or, you know, a domino set. And I'm like, man, you know? And they're like, you have pre-order? I'm like, no, I don't pre-order. Like, we can't give it to you. I'm like, look how many games. The guy goes, no, all those already been reserved. I'm like, what? Yeah, every single game's reserved. Another guy got like, bruh. He's like, yeah, everything's reserved. He says, come back tomorrow. And we'll see and whatever. People cancel their reserves or whatever, but we can't give you any of these. 
I'm like, brah. Like, is you serious? I'm like, whatever. Went to another. I went to the Chinese boutique. Same thing. Like, you got to be kidding me. Went to Toys R Us. Nah, pre-orders. I'm like, every almost every store was pre-ordered. And MSG, that sold out, whatever. I was able to get a copy like a week later. But you know what that is? Everybody's playing MG3, and I'm a MG. I'm a Metal Gear Solid fanboy. And I have to wait a week for the shit? At that date, just put my $5 down, I'm pre-ordering it, right? And that's how it was. This gen, we don't have that worry no more. There is no more worry about pre-order. Nobody, hell, we already pre-installing games. Like, games are already installed on your console before you can even play it. You Now, now you're just waiting for midnight or whatever, right? You know? So PlayStation 2 is very impressive achievement to reach 1.5 billion. PlayStation 4, with the advantages of digital store and even I would say a huge push for indies because those kind of sales I can see why PlayStation 4 will easily eclipse the eventual thing of PlayStation 2 right the sample okay what else we got here right 5 million um, VR sold I will, I'm going to be fair I'm kind of concerned with that because I think back in April they were at 4.2 they were at 4.2 in April, if I remember. I think it was April. April, you know. So since April and going past um, November, because we just had holiday season, they only sold 800,000 units. So that's a very drop, you know. And my guess is, um, you know, over the last couple of months, they haven't been releasing big games. Like Iron Man, I think is going to be a big game. They need games. I mean, let's be honest. I love VR. Trust me. I love VR. Okay. I'm when I get a PC, you know, I want to dabble VR in that too. VR is an amazing experience. But at the end of the day, just like my Sega CD or whatever, sales matters. If VR doesn't get the sales, if it doesn't sell the games, it's in trouble, right? So of course, Sony is on it's gonna be on Sony. Right? I think Sony, for VR, they definitely want to invest. Don't take the group that you have now, but invest some first-party studios to make a, to create more VR content and have kind of like an advocate. Like Yoshida. Yoshida now is going to be dealing with more indie developers, right? So... PlayStation 5 is definitely going to have great indie support for those who are into that. And there's a lot of gamers that love indies, right? But I think there's a lot of developers out there that are into VR. And they're making VR games for PC. Sony should have an advocate to directly have those developers. So that way, they're not only making it for PC, but bring it on to PlayStation. And we'll help you do whatever, right? They need to push it. Because VR is going to fail if it doesn't sell and the games don't sell. Just like anything else. No device is immune to sales. It's a consumer product, right? Right? I personally love you. I know a lot of people don't really care. Uh, in the beginning, when it was, especially was $500, I was like, oh, okay, I'm not sold on it. But once it dropped the price dramatically, I said, let me dab dabble into it. That I have it. It's, it's an amazing experience. Yes, the graphics aren't there. I will tell you that much. It's not there, Right? But the improvement in graphics, the improvement in frame rate come with more powerful hardware. So I foresee PlayStation 5 help push at least the graphical image, the frame rates of VR to a whole new level. More than even what the pros are able to do. It's going to be insane, right? Shout out to the chat. Jay Bari, what's good? Yo, Jay, what's good? Ghost, what's up, right? I'm looking forward to Iron Man. Can't wait, right? But the experience of VR. Yes, it's not for everybody. Some people get sick. Well, there's people who have epileptic seizures, can't play games. If it's not for you, it's whatever. But I'm going to tell you, some of the experiences is just so unique when you play the game, right? It changes, you know, having that headset on, and then after a while you have that headset on, the immersiveness, just the feeling that you're in that world, right? And the controls are great. Like, you know, games like Rush of Blood, you know, and stuff like that. It, it's very intuitive. It controls well. Even the Batman VR game, right? You use the controller as his hands, and you're solving puzzles. It's like Minority Report, 
you're solving riddles. It's, it's very intuitive. The controls work, which I think is the most important aspect of VR. The interaction controls, and they work. The controls are great, right? It's the graphics. A lot of people are not impressed with the graphics, and that's understandable, right? If you're playing, especially on the Pro or Xbox One X, PC, and then you see PlayStation VR graphics, you're like, oh, this doesn't look too good, right? The frame rate, a lot of people, because some games are 30 frames, especially that immersive, doesn't feel good, doesn't look good, people get headaches. That's all understandable. Hardware power will fix that, you know? Especially with this platform, it's going to fix that. And it's going to be um, amazing, right? Um, I see Jay says, PSVR is very limited. The Rift Fest is amazing compared to it. I can see PSVR 2 blowing everyone. And I, and I hear a lot of people. A lot of people telling me, yo, if you think VR is dope, ho oh, ho, wait till you see it on PC. And that's why that's another big selling point. I just got to see VR on PC. A lot of people are telling me it's freaking amazing. Expensive, but it's absolutely amazing, right? And I just hope... All of that gets to that stuff, right? So that's my concern of these is a VR. Five million, drop the price, right? Active users over 100 million. At this point, that's more than Steam. And at the end of the day, to get the active users, you just have to provide the content. Across the board, diversity. You know, it's not just Call of Duty because Call of Duty ain't bringing in 100 million active duties. Call of Duty Madden 2K, it's a small blip for monthly active users. Is that you need everything. You need those big triple A's, you know, from, you know, games as a service from the third party, right? You need the first party games that deliver. You need the indie games because a lot of those gamers are indie gamers. You need free to play to be accessible. So the games like Fortnite, Apex, Legends, Warframe, accessibility, you know, don't lock it behind a paywall. That's an important part, right? The niche games, the Japanese games, all of that. You need the whole formula. To get that number. Diversity. Diversity brings monthly active users. You know. Uh, and then finally, PS Plus subscribers, 38 million. A lot of people feel that's low, that Sony should be at 40, 50 million. I would say it's probably going to hover and stay around there. Because these users, you're talking about rounding up to, you know, 38 million, right? Let's round it down. The 39 million round up, right? Those are the ones that want to play Call of Duty. Those are the ones that want to play Madden. The games that you have to pay for the multiplayer. Right on PlayStation, you don't have to pay to play Fortnite. So a lot of those guys who play Fortnite, you know, kids and stuff like that, or even content creators and streamers on PlayStation, they're not paying PS Plus because they got Fortnite, they got Apex, they got Warframe. That's all they need. And then they play the single player games, right? So I would say that's where the combination of PlayStation Plus and monthly active users come into play, right? But all around, these stats are good for gaming. Nothing to talk shit about. I'm not here to throw in anybody's face. PlayStation console, right? But the most important part that makes this good for gaming is Nintendo and Microsoft see these numbers, right? And they want to do the same thing. When they see PlayStation 4 selling 1.15, you know, 1.15 billion games, Nintendo looks at themselves like, hey, we're going to try to do that too. We want to sell 1 billion games. Microsoft wants to sell 1 billion games. And they're going to be motivated to try to do that. When they see PlayStation with over 100 million active users, Microsoft and Nintendo wants to do that. When Microsoft sees 38 million paid subscribers, they want to do that. Even Nintendo now has their, you know, Nintendo Online that's $20 subscribers. They want 38 million people subscribing more. They want these numbers too. So they're going to put the effort to get their numbers. They're just not going to stay stagnant. Then it's going to be like, oh, you know, PlayStation's a one billion. Ah, it's cool. You know, good job, PlayStation. We don't need to worry about it. We're cool with our numbers. No. If you guys could do it, so can we. And they're going to put their best foot forward to do that. So it's good for gaming because Nintendo and Microsoft, they completely see what's achievable in console gaming. Those numbers are easily achievable for those consoles. They just have to find a way to do it with their model, with their method. So those numbers that PlayStation are showing is good for gaming because it's while it seems like PlayStation is the only ones doing it, other companies, primarily Nintendo and Microsoft, they can do it too. There's no reason why Xbox can't end up selling a billion games, right? They just have to find a way to get people to attract their console. They're going to have to invest in advertisement, send the right message, create the compelling games, 
get people to want to buy games, right? Or at the re release, if they're going to do something with Game Pass, whatever the metrics. Same thing with Nintendo, right? Nintendo sells a lot of games, especially with their first party. Like, Breath of the Wild was still top 20 in this November MPD. And that game came out in March 2017. So they do sell a lot of software. Those numbers are achievable. Monthly active users is possible. Sony showed it with PlayStation. Microsoft and Nintendo can do it too. They just need to put the effort and continue on in that. Right? So that's why it's good for gaming. The success of PlayStation brand is a representative of what other people could potentially do. Right? It's potential. Other companies just need to follow through with that. Okay? A final point, and I'm going to open it up to a Q&A, because it's been a while since I have a Q&A. So start typing your Q&As. The next generation consoles comes out in November, right? Holiday. That's what they said. But I think we all could agree it's going to be November, because November is the, the biggest month in gaming in terms of sales and content. It does the best in November. So I think we all could fairly assume... Xbox, Xbox, SX, and PlayStation 5 is coming out in November, right? Regardless of when we get the official specs from Xbox or PlayStation 5, your expectation of when you think you're going to get it and the company didn't meet your expectation is not a sign that the brand's in trouble. A lot of people expected Sony to do a reveal at CES, get the specs, Show how the console looks, something to that line, and it didn't happen. And now everybody's like, oh, I think Sony's in trouble, or they're arrogant, or they're this stuff. And that has nothing to do with it. How, how people are coming up with the correlation is beyond me. Because at the end of the day, we're all the earliest any of us are going to be able to play these consoles is November. So whether we get information in January or the full reveal in June, it all leads to the same exact destination a November purchase be lucky if we're even able to pre-order these consoles in August we might not even be able to do that all right it's not definitely not gonna be earlier we're definitely not gonna be able to pre-order these consoles in July that's rare okay most of the pre-orders will start in August right maybe September for Xbox and PlayStation the road leads to November that's when you're going to get your hands on your consoles. That's around the window where Digital Foundry and outlets will get the games. And they'll be able to break down how the games actually perform. Because there's specs and there's real world performance. There's specs that you hear, which leads to the expectation of how you think the games are going to run. And then there's the real world performance of how the games are actually running. That all leads to November. So whether you get the information today or you get the information in June or anywhere in between, it's the same thing because the consoles comes out in November. Holiday 2020, right? So when Microsoft, and in this case, Sony, because that's where the target, because I, there was a lot of expectations for, you know, the Consumer Electronics Show. So that's where most of it's come from, uh the fact that we didn't get any information on PlayStation 5 in terms of specs, how the consoles look, whatever, at Consumer Electronics Show has no bearing on, oh, Sony's arrogant. What does, how, how is a company arrogant by not revealing a product in Consumer Electronics Show? They never made no statements of that that's where they're going to put it, right? Whenever Sony decides to say, hey, this is when, this is the reveal of the PlayStation, it's going to be before November. And that's it. You know, it's funny because a lot of people are using information that doesn't make sense to determine how successful a console is, which doesn't make sense. A reveal doesn't really determine or, or when you think a reveal is supposed to happen, you know, doesn't really determine the success of a console. You can say after the reveal, the type of message they sent that could hurt a console. Example, the Xbox One reveal. That wasn't a very good reveal. When you're primarily talking about TV, very little gaming, sports, how the console will be a multimedia hub and not much about gaming. Yeah, that's not a good reveal. That could hurt, you know, if Sony did something like that. But if you had an expectation, be like, oh, yeah, Sony's like a lot of people even now are saying they think Sony's going to repeat 
what they did with PlayStation 4 and do a February review. A lot of people are expecting a February review only because that's what they did with PS4. I have no expectation of a reveal other than it's going to be before the PlayStation 5 launch. That's it. That's my expectation. I know I'm going to see a spec reveal before the console sold in stores. Right? Because if Sony decides to do their reveal for PlayStation 5 in March, right? Instead of February, where a lot of people expect, is that a failure? Does it not count anymore? Because they did it in March and they didn't do it in February. There's no rule of when the reveal is going to be other than they have to show it before the actual product is sold because they're trying to advertise it. They have to let the world know this is the product we are going to sell to you. So it's going to come before that. That's it. That's my only expectation for it. Other than that, I don't try to read into it, right, on the success of the brand. Caleb Hunter, thank you so much for the super chat. He says, hey, just wanted to drop by to say hello, and I'm glad to see the PSVR selling so well when Mooch and Crap were bashing it, and I hope it keeps going, you know. I do. I hope so, too. I hope, you know, PlayStation VR. I hope VR across the industry just keeps getting bigger and bigger because it is, it's, it's the product that we need. It is great and it coincides great with the traditional gaming that we do. It is a great, it is the definitive way um, for a new experience, right? Okay. The things to look at, and even then it's still too early, right? To gauge how a console is going to do, it's obviously the specs, which we don't have, right? That's a portion of it. The price is a huge part, right? Of it, Okay. The message they send with this product, right? Certain keywords help sells consoles, helps a console be successful. Keywords like exclusives and stuff like that, you know? The type of first party games they make, you know? The type of deals they make with third party, you know? How many third party games are only available on the PlayStation versus how many are on Xbox and vice versa? Does the company f try to get exclusive content? You know, sure, the game is multiplayer and available on both platforms, but is there exclusive content, exclusive DLC maps? Call of Duty, who's going to get the Call of Duty deal? Who's going to get the 30-day maps? Those things are factors. Not the definitive factor, but they help paint the bigger picture. All these things, right, paint a picture towards the success of a console. Vedger, thanks so much for the super chat. Sony sees The Last of Us 2, FSS Remake, Ghost of Tsushima cells are more important then announce a PS5 and possibly harm game sales on PS4. Good to have you back. Appreciate it. No doubt was here. Great point Vegeta makes. Sony still has a lot of big games. Now, The Last of Us comes out in May. Because she comes out in summer. So there's going to be some PS5 information that's going to be around those games as well. Sony's not going to wait till after Ghost of Tsushima to finally talk about PlayStation 5. So there's going to be in that window. My man Jay Barry, that's a thousand dollars, G. P Rock, rate my bars. You don't really want it with Jay. Check my record. I'll make you red, man, because you feel my method. Best list. <laughs> oh, fuck it. You know what I'm saying? My man, my man Jay Barr. That's 10 out of 10, B. That's the hotness. You know, who's the greatest rapper in the world? Who's the greatest top five rapper in the world? Bari, 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 Bari. <laughs> if you people know Dylan, right? Okay. So let's check. Let me get into the QC right now. So I don't know if anybody has questions. Um, hit them up. Hit them up with the QC. Because uh, I'm about to be out after this quick QC. I'm about to play some Death Stranding. Yes, I'm playing Death Stranding. Um, I'll give my review. I'm always late with my review. Well, I'm not really late with my reviews. So I take my time and enjoy the game. So that's why I don't really say I'm a reviewer of games. Because I don't get review copies and I don't rush to it, right? I'm not, it's not like I'm trying to sell the game. I'm just giving you my point behind it, right? Um, uh, let's see. Um, what we got here? What we got here? Um, let's see. Uh, there's, no, no, there's no question. There's no questions. Uh, 
Will Xbox unlock those achievements PS4 have achieved? Not this gen. Will they ever? I don't know. Um, Game Pass changes a lot of things. It's going to change the sales model on Xbox. You know, the more people get wind of it, they're going to buy less games and they're just going to stay subscribed to Game Pass and they're just going to let Game Pass. You know, unless it's one of those big games like Call of Duty, which I doubt Call of Duty will ever be day one on Game Pass. Battlefield probably most likely will never be day one on Game Pass. There's certain games that just won't be day one on Game Pass, right? Madden is another one. Those games will be bought, right? But other games, especially the double A's, you know, like Dishonored, the Mafias, um, the Watch Dogs, you know, things like that. I think people will just, Devil May Cry, already said presidents. Um, I think a lot of people will just be like, ah, I'll just wait for Game Pass. It'll probably go on Game Pass anyway. And people will just pay their $10 a month subscription service, and they're just going to let Game Pass be the method of what games they play, you know? I can't do that. I can't let a subscription service dictate to me if I'm going to play a game or not. If I see a game and I want to play it, I'm going to buy it. I'm not going to be like, damn, I want to play that game, but it might go to Game Pass. So I'm going to wait to see if it shows up. And in the meantime, I'm going to play this trash-ass game because that's what's on Game Pass. I'm not doing that. That's just why Game Pass or PS Now is not for me. I'm not letting a service dictate to me. Now, if the service got every game day one, Everything across the industry, you know, first party, third party, like literally day one. Now I, I probably could mess with for subscription plan because I'm not the subscription plan is not dictating what it is. If it got everything across the board day one, where it's no different than buying a game, I got that. But the way it is now on PlayStation and Xbox is like like my man said, Rome. Like I said before, I'm I'm not into this dollar value meal gaming. I don't go to McDonald's and worry about a four-piece nugget and small fries and a small Sunday. I'm in there. Give me the goddamn number one Big Mac. Supersize that bitch. Give me the apple pies and give me that, you know, out here in Germany, they have this thing called the chicken box. It's like literally like 15 nuggets and like 10 pieces of chicken wings. Oh, my God. United States needs to get the chicken box. That's me. You know what I'm saying? I ain't worried about, you know, value meal, right? JD Gamer, will you give the SS positive coverage if next gen is 15 plus studios start pumping up bangers, two prong attack, provide great sales? I'm going to tell you, JD, I'm going to be honest. Next gen, I'm not going to be talking about Xbox console at all. It's just, it's not, I'm not even going to, unless the podcast or I'm on Zaire's podcast, you know, or if, you know, because I'm going to start off my podcast and the panel members, because some of them will probably have the Xbox X and they bring it up in conversation or something crazy stupid happens. But for the most part, it's going to primarily be PlayStation 5. And then shortly after or sometime after, I'll have a PC. And then we'll see what Nintendo goes, right? Um, now I'm going to wait for this, see if this Switch Pro is true, whatever. Um, and that's going to be more my conversation. I will talk about the games. If the games are good, then the games are good. You know what I'm saying? Watch me talk more about Hellblade than y'all motherfuckers. Because y'all saw my rant video. It's going to be 250K again. But anyway, um, just a little rant right there. But it's going to be mostly PS5, PC, the games that Microsoft makes that I play on PC, right? And Nintendo and stuff. But again, if I'm on a podcast, obviously Zaire is going to talk about Xbox X. So I'll put my input there. My uh, 60 Frames Don't Like podcast is going to be back. So obviously a lot of panel members, guests, you know, because uh, when I have my podcast, I always, you know, always, yeah, I had a lot of, Pro Xbox guys on my podcast. I had kids move on there. I had a lot of guys on there, right? I had Rand showed up. So, of course, they're going to want to talk about topics on Xbox, and that's just topics, all right? But as far as me, it's, it's pretty much, I moved on. I'll move next gen is really more the games Microsoft make from the perspective of what I see from PC and stuff like that. But if the game's good, then the game's good. A good game is a good game, right? That's it, like me. Um, one of my favorite games is Cuphead. I love the game, right? Absolutely love it. Beat it in three days. I beat it before a lot of Xbox dudes beat it. You know what I'm saying? But I thank you for the super chat, but that's just me, and that's that's the direction I'm going um, next gen, all right? So you won't see me talk a lot about the console itself. It is what it is. A lot of people will talk about it and stuff. Hopefully nothing crazy happens, you know? If something, if something does crazy happens, let's say in a good way. Let's say for something like Xbox XX is the number one selling 
console in the U.S., then yeah, you're going to hear about that. I'm going to say, hey, Xbox SX is once again the number one seller in PD. It's breaking records. It's surpassing sales. Yeah, you're going to hear that from me. And hopefully you don't hear nothing crazy negative about it, right? Your PC, if you buy MS games, is still the Xbox platform, just not the console. MS is changing the nature of gaming platform, at least what defines a platform. Ah, uh, Whatever. I mean, MS could say whatever they want. At the end of the day, MS could say they could try to play coy with their word of what Xbox is. I'm making decisions based on what I want. And right? And my decision between PC and Xbox is simply because um, um, games. A lot of people look at me when I say PC. Oh, if you want power, I'm like, at no point that I ever say I'm going PC because of power. At no point. In fact, chances are my PC is probably going to be a 1440p gaming machine. I'm not going to go balls to the walls with 4K, Ultra 8K, or any of that stuff. At no point that I ever say I'm going PC because of power. It's if, if, if people know what you guys should know about now, I am not a power guy. If you guys haven't realized that now, by any means, I have not been a super power guy. As long as the company makes a decent system with the performance that makes developers happy, then that's it. I'm good with that, right? It's a content decision, right? Because you got Xbox One X and you got the PC. They're both going to be supported equally by Microsoft. Microsoft is going to make games for both platforms, right? So you got that level, right? They're both going to have potentially maybe third-party games that's not available on PlayStation 5. So there may be a few third-party games that PlayStation, that, you know, maybe where there's a third-party deal or whatever, that's going to be on Xbox and PC, but not on PlayStation 5. So there's that factor, right? Both platforms will have Game Pass if I want to deal with that, but you guys already know I'm not really into that. But it's there, right? But where PC has the advantage now is PC gets its own exclusives with Steam. So that's an advantage over the Xbox. And VR. So that's why I'm leaning towards PC. I'm not going to be missing out on Microsoft games. I'm not going to be missing out on third-party games that's not available on PS5. And then on top of that, PC exclusives, if there's any that I'm interested in. I know one I, I am interested in is Vampire the Masquerade the Part 2, I think it is. I really want to play that. And then VR. I definitely really want VR. So it's just a whole... It's content. That's all it is. It ain't power, 4K, whatever. It ain't that. It ain't more bang for your buck when in terms of graphics... And all that is none of that. At no point am I looking at PC because of the better version of the multiplex. That's not my reason. It's content. That's all I care about. And with that, I'm gonna get the content. What else we got there? Um, what other questions do I see here? Um, definitely hit that like button. We got 200 you viewers. Truly appreciate it. Um, uh, do you think Gran Turismo will be a launch title? What about the demo and AK talked about? Sorry if confirmed or dispelled. I don't know. A lot of rumors about GT7 being a possible launch title. Um, I think Sony might see the importance of that game releasing early rather than later. I don't think it's going to be AK. I think if I remember reading that article, I think if I remember correctly, Kaz, I can't pronounce his whole name, you know, but he runs uh, Polyphony Digital. I think the point he was trying to make is he already built the assets of GT so it can be fully rendered in AK natively. So he already created the assets. I don't think he's trying to hint it at the next console, Sony pushing it. I think he was just saying he already created the tool sets and he's pretty much ready for AK. If a hardware can render AK, Gran Turismo is ready for AK because the assets, the textures, it's AK ready. But I don't think PlayStation 5 is going to push it. I think it's still going to be 4K, and they're going to go with native 60 frames, at least with that game. And I think that's what that's more hinting at. But his thing was Gran Turismo has the 8K assets, so he's already there with that. Um, uh, I need another laptop next gen. Uh, let's see. And that's the thing decision for me. Um, do I go with laptop? Because there's some nice hardware that's coming out. Might be a little bit more expensive. Um, but there's laptops, nice laptops that run games at 1440p, great graphics and stuff, right? And I saw this one laptop, I think it's by Asus, is dual screen. So you got the screen right there, but then on the side, you have another screen that's touch 
is really nice looking. It's a little bit big and bulky, but the reason why it's powerful hardware, right? Um, and that's why I want to wait till 2021. Um, if you saw Ryzen CES, the GPU, I know a lot of people are disappointed with the desktop GPU because they're like, oh, we got next generation 1080p GPU. And everybody's like, what? 1080p? Like, like people, I think people are expecting high end GPUs, not into that. But I saw some of the mobile processors that they were releasing. I'm like, man, those are really powerful processors. Combine it with a really good mobile GPU, you know, laptop GPU, get a nice, decent 1440p 60 frame bells and whistles laptop right and the reason why i might go with the laptop right um hopefully is docking station compatible and if you don't know what a docking station is well you should you know it's kind of self-explanatory um at work i have my work laptop and it has a docking station so i take the laptop you know slide on the docking station and now i use a keyboard mouse and you know a monitor and it's like a desktop now right nintendo switch pretty much and then when I have to go somewhere, but I need to take my laptop with me because it's work-related, I just take the laptop and go. I would like to do the same type of setup at home where I have a docking station. So I put the laptop on a docking station and then treat it like a desktop, you know, with the keyboard, mice, nice monitor and stuff, right? But when I'm on the go, unplug it. Now I'm on the go, but I still can game on the go. And that's I'm really interested. And I think still a powerful laptop with a decent... You know, with the technology that's in these laptops now, I'll still be able to do my streams. Um, definitely want to get to video editing. You know, I want to I want to take my channel to the next level, you know, and I think it's going to be a great I think that's a great solution. What do you guys think? Yes, I know desktop will always be better. Desktop will always be the premium way and a lot of times cheaper. Right. Um, because you don't have to worry about portability. Right. But I think it gives me the edge of having a laptop that's portable. I could get games on the go. And still do what I got to do, right? You know, have the laptop, still have the whole desktop feel and setup. You know, again, I think that's what um, I'm trying to do, right? And I think it's, it takes up less space and I don't have this big bulky thing. Um, so I'm going to be paying attention to Ryzen and what they do, all right? I'm pretty sure Intel will try to counter, create CPUs that's high performance, low wattage, you know, I'm sure NVIDIA will try to do the same thing. High performance GPUs with low wattage, you know, just like that. You know, someone does it first, but then eventually somebody does it better. Right. So I think that's my um stuff. Jay Barry says I dock my laptop in game. And I think that's the that's the direction I want to go. So that's why I'm waiting a little while for my PC because I want to see what's out there and what best fits for me. Um, you know, so get into that. What else? Um. Oh, now for GT seven, if it is a launch exclusive, I know a lot of people are going to be excited. I'm going to be like, cause I'm not buying that trash. Oh my God. Like I got it. Huge. There's a lot of huge racing fans. A lot of gamers love racing games. I'm not knocking you, but you all know. Like, you know, I get like, you know, allergic reactions when I touch a racing game disc, you know, like I get, you know, my face rolls, ew, I, uh, my, you know, my, I, I can't breathe, it, I throw up, get diarrhea, it's like, ugh, you know, racing games is just terrible, right? So if Gran Turismo 7 is the big game for launch, you're not going to hear a lot of excitement from me. It's not going to be a very exciting launch for me. So I hope there's at least two big games or whatever, um, and we'll see how it goes, right? Um, but for me, I know a lot of people ask if PlayStation doesn't have a big exclusive, right? Because if people remember, I didn't buy a PS4 at launch because they didn't have the exclusives I want, right? So a lot of people were thinking, I'm going to do the same thing with PlayStation 5. If it doesn't have a lot of big exclusives that I want, does that mean I'm going to wait until they come out or am I going to get a PS5 day one? I am going to get a PS5 day one because the biggest thing that it's going to do that I just dying and I want it so bad is no loading or minimal loading. I'm tired of loading. I'm just tired. I'm sick of it. It's annoying. You know, it's just, it's just, it's just old. It's just getting old. Right? So once Sony, you know, and I thought I just had to deal with it. So I just, 
I just kept my mouth shut. You guys never heard me complain about loading because I thought it was just be something we will ever, we will always have to deal with, right? But once Sony came out with that leak of Spider-Man with no loading, 0.8 seconds, and that's rendered and moving, I can't go back. I'm, I'm just, I cringe right now with the games I'm playing now with loading. I, I'm done with loading. I got to get a PlayStation 5 because I got to free myself from loading. You know, I think that and Xbox is doing it too is probably the best Feature out of anything. I know everybody's talking about the T flops and all that. PlayStation 3D audio haptic. Nah, screw that. Zero loading is possibly the greatest thing for console gaming, where you can just press start and boom, just get into there and just play. Oh, I cannot wait. That's 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 my that's my expectation. I just that's. If there's anything I'm going to definitely pay attention to, of course, I'm going to pay attention to reveal in all aspects. But when, let's say if I have a podcast, right? You know, we talk in the background, we talk whatever. When Sony starts talking about the loading, I'm going to mute everybody in the panel. If Jay Barry is there, my man J-Dub all day, if we get the crew back, when Sony starts talking about SSD and loading, yeah, I'm muting. Everybody's getting muted. Ain't nobody talking. I'm going to mute the chat. Ain't nobody, ain't nobody talking. I'm going to put everybody on timeout. There'll be no screens. Like, we are paying attention 100% on, on the loading thing. <laughs> All right? I got yeah, I got to be low free. I'm a, you know what I'm saying? I'm going to rename the podcast 60 Frames No Load. All right? No loading podcast. <laughs> All right? You know, it's going to be renamed 60 Frames No Loading Podcast, all right? I'm, yo, ain't nobody talking. I'm going to shut down the super chat. I don't care if you drop $1,000, G. Ain't nobody saying nothing. We're just going to say, shh. Pay attention to what Sony's saying for the next 10 minutes. <laughs> we are, on that day, 60 Frames No Load, all right? That's, that's, that's why I have to get a PlayStation 5, you know? I just got to do it. Um, yo, P Rock, what martial art did you use when you were in the military? <laughs> that's a that's a that's a random question. So I'm in the Marine Corps. Um, and the Marine Corps has um a martial arts program. Um, the UMCC martial arts program. It's called the McMack program. On um, the Marine Corps martial arts program, McMap M C M A P, right? Um, we call it Semper Fu, whatever, right? Um, that's the program the Marine Corps has. It's a belt system, right? Um, you start out as a tan belt, or you have to earn your tan belt, but everybody graduates boot camp as a tan belt at least. So when you graduate boot camp, you have to be a tan belt. And then there's gray, green, brown, and then black belt, Right? You have to put in so many hours into each training. And it's it's unlike civilian martial arts. Civilian martial arts will always be better, right? Civilian martial arts will always be better. There's, there's, you can't compare it to what, what a civilian martial arts is, right? It's not comparable, okay? In terms of using it to defend yourself in the street, right? Many of the moves, or I'm sorry, ooh, that would have been... That I would have been in trouble. Many of the techniques are borrowed, stolen from martial arts disciplines. A little bit of boxing in terms of how to punch and block. A little bit of judo, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, you know. A little bit of Krav Maga. It's just a little bit of mixture of mixed martial arts, right? But the techniques used is geared towards a combat or a riot control environment. It's not really geared for when you're in a bar fight, right? And you guys may be thinking, that's kind of weird. The training is geared for what you need to do in combat, right? And in combat, you know, civilian martial arts, um, it says civilian martial arts. Civilian martial arts is more like a fight where you defend yourself, right? You know, boxing. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, Karate. It's all about self-defense. In fact, that's what they call it, self-defense. While Marine Corps martial arts, it's kill the motherfucker as fast as possible because you're in war. 
kill him. That's really what it is. Kill the guy. It's not really jab, jab, knock a guy out. I mean, they do teach those techniques, whatever. But ultimately, it's a very ground, you know, with weapons, get on the ground, choke the guy out until he dies, blood choke, snap his arm, then kill him. It's, it's always going to result in death, other than the riot control training. Because we also do riot control, you're not going to kill, you know, you're not going to kill in the riot. You have to just suppress them and detain them and stuff like that. That's really what it is, right? You could be a black belt in the Marine Corps, you can still get your ass kicked in a bar fight, you know? Because, again, Marine Corps martial arts is trained to kill. You're not going to do that in a bar fight. If, if a Marine goes and actually does that, you're going to go to jail. You're not going to go smash a bottle and stab him right in the throat. Like, that's what they train us to do. That's like the weapons of opportunity this part, right? You see a weapon, take him, shove it in his throat, you know? <laughs> you know? You're not going to do that in a bar fight. In a bar fight, somebody wants to fight you, you're going to do the traditional self-defense, you know, get that shot in his chin, or, you know, you fall in the ground, you punch him a couple of times, and you end the fight. Marine Corps martial arts is not really like that, you know? It's just really not like that, you know? So it's not going to make you the best fighter, but it's really designed for you to do what you got to do in combat, especially for a lot of guys who, you'd be surprised, there's a lot of people who joined the Marine Corps, but they never actually had a fight in their life. They don't know how to fight. You know, it's just it just is what it is. They're learning to fight in the Marines for the first time. They don't know what it is to get punched in the face until they join the Marine Corps and they go through, you know, the boxing and, you know, the, um, the pugil sticks and all that stuff. They never experience violence until they join the Marine Corps. So there's a lot of guys who were, um, who did that, you know, um, you know, and there's guys in the Marine Corps who grew up like, so there's a black belt, right? Then after the black belt, you have the tabs, first degree, second degree, everybody, when you are in black belt, you're a black belt, first degree, right? That's, but after that, second degree, third degree, fourth degree, fifth degree, the only way to get those degrees of black belt, you know, those red tabs, you had to now be civilian. You know, you have to have civilian accreditation. You have to be a black belt, Dan, whatever, in a different, whether it's boxing, you have to be, whether you're into boxing, jujitsu, whatever, you need civilian. Um, so a lot of the Marine Corps, you know, black belt instructors, right, that are second degree or higher, they've been doing civilian Martial arts. They've been doing martial arts all their lives. So those guys are the guys that will fuck you up, right? Those guys will beat the shit out of you in a bar. Those are the MMA guys, right? There's even a couple of guys who fall in MMA. Um, Lieutenant Stan or Captain Stan. I don't know if you ever heard of him. You know, low-level MMA fighter. Um, I actually deployed with him in combat. We were we were in 3-2 together. And then we deployed in combat together. Um, Captain Stan. Just look up the name Captain Stan MMA. Um, you know. He was big into martial arts and stuff. And then he left the Marine Corps. He got out of the Marine Corps and ultimately went to do MMA um, and stuff like that. Right? So, good, weird question, but I think it's pretty cool that I answered that stuff. All right? Um, over 200 people watching. Push that like button. You know, help a brother out. Um, what else? Uh, let's see. Burger King rules because the Triple Whopper is huge. Uh, you should try Wendy's Baconator. Heart attack, but it's so good, um, so good. Um, let me see. Uh, let me see. Uh, can you John Wick? Uh, no, I ain't John. John Wick. That's that. Ain't nobody learning what John Wick learns. That's a whole different, you know. That's a whole different dude right there. Um, what is it? Let's see. Um, my man said jarhead shit. Oh, that's because I'm in Germany in G6. Um, so for those of you that was in the military, so I'll explain that. A lot of people, some units, like, all right, if you notice the last couple of months, if you, so I haven't been able to do a lot of podcasts. I'm just starting it up again. So some units are busier than others. Um, some units depending on how I was at, there's no way I'll be doing a podcast. Hell, I'll be deploying, whatever. The unit I'm in, 
is not a deployable unit. We don't deploy to combat. You know, we're a higher echelon. We're a higher headquarters, you know, where I'm at, right? So what we do, we support the units that are deployed so they could do their jobs. You know what I'm saying? Um, my daughter, she's 24. So I have no kids anymore. So it's just me and my wife. And you'd be surprised when you have no more kids in the house. There's a lot of time, whatever, right? And stuff. Um, so I do have a lot of time for stuff. Uh, when I move to California, though, I'm going to do my best to manage my time because I'm going to finish my degree. You know, uh, the last couple of jobs and even here, I didn't have time to finish my degree. So I got to finish it. Um, so it's going to be a mixed bag and stuff. But I think once my daughter got older and moved out and whatever, that helped. That, you'd be surprised how much time you put into your kids, which rightfully so. Um, and then the units I was in, again, if you're like in a high deployable unit, yeah, because if you're in a unit that deploys, before you deploy, you have to do the workup. So you practice training, you're in the field, you come back in the field, spend a couple of days at home, go back to the field. If you're not in the field, you're doing some type of class, some type of training, or you go to a school. It's just a lot of stuff. And then depending on your position, like in me, not only would I have to train and get ready for myself, I have to make sure the Marines under my charge are going to the schools, are going to the field, are getting the training going to weapons, going to the ranges, physical fitness. You have to manage all that stuff. Lots of stuff, right? And you still have to do the plan, get the equipment ready, get it shipped out, get it packed, talk to the commanding officer. The commanding officer is going to spread his vision of why he wants to, what he or she wants to do in the mission while we're out deploying. And you have to come up with the plan to meet that vision. You have to identify the Marines that can do the mission. It's just a lot of stuff. So yeah, it's... So PS Plus Ultra, it is a lot of stuff. I'm just not in that unit where we deploy. What we do, we're higher headquarters. We support the units that do that. If they need help, we help them. So, you know, so it's been a good break being here in Germany like that. It's been a good time. I'm going to miss Germany. I'm not going to lie. I'm going to miss um, Europe. Europe's been fantastic. It's been a fantastic place. Love, you know, Germany's been great. I love it. Um, what else we got? Uh, I think I'm going to cut it down here. Um, hey, appreciate it, Fonz. Hey, man, my prayers are with you with your son. Um, deployed. If people don't know, uh, grounded gamer Fonzarelli, his kids in the military, Air Force, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and they're deploying his son out there to the Middle East. So, definitely my prayers. Um, but I'm sure you know your son's smart, got good training, and I think he'll be all right. He'll do the right thing. And plus, Air Force have it right. They send their officers to fight. They put them on a plane. They be like, yep, get your ass out there. <laughs> the officers have it right, all right? Um, you know, so, you know, they get them officers ready. Yep, get on, you know, hurry up, get on that plane, sir, and get out of here. Kuwait's a pretty, uh, I've been to Kuwait, Camp Commando, um, Good location. I understand you don't want to hear that because as a father, Middle East is Middle East no matter where, but it's a good location, stuff like that. Um, great bases and stuff like that. Um, so I'm sure your son will be fine, but you know my prayers were with him. Um, uh, hello, Puerto Rock. Where are you right now in Germany? Which city? Right now in Germany, I'm in Boblingen area, um, Panzer Kasern, the army base. That's where I actually live at. Um, I don't know if you're familiar. Um, it's about 30 minutes away from Stuttgart. Um, so that's where I live at now. Um, on the base on Panzer Concern, uh, in the Bubbligan area, 30 minutes away from Stuttgart. Um, great area. Um, and stuff. Uh, oh yeah, absolutely love, love Germany. Been to Italy. My last trip, I want to try to hit London. I got to hit up London because that's my last final thing that I wanted to do. Um, stuff like that. Um, let's see. Don't forget to hit the like button. Um, he's fob hopping to smaller bases camps in different locations. Depending on the location. If it's throughout Kuwait, he'll be all right. Kuwait is on the border of Iraq. So if he travels through Iraq, you know what I'm saying? Uh, I don't want to worry you, but I see your concerns if he's traveling. If he stays within the vicinity of Kuwait, he'll be all right. Because there are multiple bases in Kuwait. So if he's supporting the Kuwait structure, um, he'll be all right. Um, Kuwait's a uh, beautiful, uh, you know, there's places in Kuwait that are beautiful and I'm very wealthy. Uh, I remember, uh, they have TGI Fridays out there. It's crazy. All right. Uh, but I see what you're saying once, you know, from Kuwait, if he enters Iraq, I see what you're saying. Um, uh, 
Let's see what else. Uh, German beer is phenomenal. Uh, my man, 1985 says, P Rock, you've been getting tipsy off that awesome German beer. German beer is phenomenal. I can't go back to American beer. That's not. That's not happening. When German beer says American beer tastes like piss, I understand. There's no going back. I can't go back to American beer. It, it's not possible. German beer. They even have laws. I didn't know that. But it's actual federal. I use the word federal, but German country law, there is rules that if you're going to call a product a beer, these are the rules behind it. If you don't follow these rules, you are not allowed to call this beer. It's crazy. And it's fantastic, right? Yes, I've been to Berlin. Um, that was one of the first places I visited. Was there for four days, been to the Berlin Zoo. Me and my wife went out there. We stood at the Hilton one time. Um, and we stood like at the heart of the city. And I'll be honest, you know, we would try to do the whole cultural thing, but what ended up was like two, three nights of going dancing every night and getting shit faced and then like passing out in the hotel, <laughs> get something to eat and do it all over again. Cause this is a party town. And then we just had so much fun. Oh, we felt like kids again. It was fantastic. Right. Um, uh, uh, Oh, my man, DI. So people, I can't answer. All right. When you coming back, uh, April, April is when I have to report to California. A. Um, Enninger is great. Yeah, that's that's very popular out here. I like uh, Wissen beer. I didn't know what it's called. I missed the Autobahn. Oh, that Autobahn. Yo, I dropped. Yo, I have my Maxim, Nissan Maxim out here, and I pushed that sucker to 140 miles an hour. And it's legal. The Autobahn is like the highway. It's pretty much the highway, but there's parts where it's unrestricted, meaning there is no speed limit. Drop the hammer if you want. And it's... Cops won't pull you over, nothing. You know, get to the far left lane and drop that hammer. And so I said, you know what, let me try it. And I pushed my car to 140. Oh, like my hands were shaking. My palms of my hands were sweating. I couldn't feel the car on the road. Like everything was just like, you know, when you're driving, you, you know, you feel the grip. You don't feel no grip. It's like, right? And when you're driving, I don't know what it is, but at that speed, like, Everything was just like I couldn't I don't want to explain it, but I was driving so fast that I was only able to see this like everything else was hazy and I'm seeing everything just going fast. I mean, everything was just blurred, but I see this like like everything went like this. Right. And as once I broke 125, 130 and I got approaching to 140, everything was just going this and then it just got to this. Right. And then everything was just like. Right. And my hands was drenching. And I thought to myself at that moment, if one little rock interferes, I'm dead. And I just slowed down and I just went back to middle lane. And then from that day on, I just drove like 110 miles. 110 miles is fine. Right. 110. And it burns a lot of gas. Like the gas, you can see the gas meter is going like literally you see the needle just soak. It's just sucking gas. At 140 miles per hour, that thing was just like, I mean, it was just like a Slurpee, right? And even then, right? Because people have Lambos out here, high-end Mercedes, and they're like, I could see in the mirror, they're just catching up to me. They're just ready to hit me, and I still had to pull over. These dudes are pushing 170, some 200 miles an hour. I mean, I saw a Ferrari, right? I'm doing like 110, 120, and that thing just, like, I'm in the middle lane, and it just went, and then all of a sudden, within two seconds, I see the headlight like this small, the rear tail light, real tiny, and then disappear. Within seconds, they're gonna die. You know, it's one of those areas where you're dead. Like, if you get into an accident, don't worry about calling insurance. There is no insurance. You're dead. You killed yourself and whoever you crashed into. Uh, so, but it was just crazy. Um, the, the 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 unrestricted lanes it's literally everybody's driving fast you know it's crazy but out here in germany um it's super expensive to get a license it's crazy expensive america listen you guys don't know how good we have it in the united states for the simple stuff it's insane so let's talk about the driver's license i mean it's just i know there's not gaming but you know a little culture just to give you an idea right so i'm in the barbershop I, you know, I don't have a barber here in Germany like I do back in the States, especially North Carolina or New York, right? But, you know, 
I use the barbershop on base. It is what it is, right? But it's Germans, right? A lot of Germans there. And it was actually um a lot of the barbers on base were females, German females, whatever, right? So anyway, so this is one German female, the barber that I, I normally go to. She's not there no more. But she was talking about how she's going to get her motorcycle license, right? You know, and stuff. And we're like, oh, cool. And she's like, yeah, well, it's a little bit cheaper than the driver's license. She only has to pay like, you know, 900 euros or 1,000 euros, right? That's what she said. So it's cheaper than a car. 1,000 euros is like eleven, twelve hundred dollars $1,200, right? And I, like, I said, she's cutting my hair. And we talk, I'm like... That's like eleven hundred dollars, right? And I'm like, "Are you kidding me? Eleven hundred dollars for a motorcycle license?" The girl, the barber next to us, right? She's another barber, but she's from Cyprus. So even though she lives in Germany, she's Cyprian, right? She's from Cyprus. Yeah, so see, even she was like, "Yeah, that's pretty expensive." I'm like, "Yeah, how much you pay?" She's like, "Yeah, where are you from? It's like six hundred euros." So seven hundred dollars. And I looked at her like, are you kidding me? Six, seven hundred euros? Equivalent to seven hundred dollars? And they're looking at me like I'm not. So they asked me, how much do you pay? I'm like, eighty dollars. The girl dropped the clippers on the floor. You know, she's like, and she's like, eighty dollars. I'm like, it's a freaking car license. Like, what are you guys doing? Like, hell, in some places in the United States, kids graduate with a driver's license because there's some schools that offer driver's ed as a curriculum towards your high school diploma. So you could graduate with a driver's license along with your high school diploma at 17, 18. And they're looking at me like, hold up, you can graduate and driving is part of your graduation requirement. I'm like, yeah. Yeah. They lost their minds. They lost their minds. They couldn't, they like, like, we didn't, like, everybody, like, when we, when we brought that up, the other barbers heard it, like, everybody stopped doing haircuts, and we were talking about that for, like, 10 minutes, right? And even the people on the chair, like, we were all conversating in the barbershop now of how ridiculous it costs to get a freaking haircut, like, it, it felt like a movie, they couldn't believe it. And then the guys in the back like, oh, yeah, in Alabama, I got my license at 15. Like, yo, know, and, and the Germans are just losing their minds because, like, a car license is, like, $1,600, and they have to put in, like, 40 hours of driving time. I'm, like, 40 hours to drive. Like, my wife got her license in North Carolina the same day, right? I told them, my wife, right, when we moved to North Carolina, because New York, we don't get licenses, right, because we have the trains, right? But my wife got married. We moved to North Carolina, military orders. North Carolina, right? I already taught her how to drive, so she's been driving my car, you know, illegally with no license for a while. You know, it's just a Puerto Rican in us, right? But to get her license, she went to North Carolina, went to DMV. She, they sat her down, take the written, passed the written. She waited an hour to take the driver's test. She took the driver's test, came back. Driver's test was like 10 minutes. Gave her a temporary license right there on the spot. It was like less than two hours to do everything. When I told them that, they flipped out like all of them like nobody was getting haircuts for like 10 minutes and everybody's talking how crazy Europe. and there's apparently that's like that all throughout europe people are spending twenty five hundred dollars norway oh my god when i learned how they get their license norway so in norway they spend almost three thousand dollars for a license right so in norway they have to take this Ridiculous test which only has like a 50% pass rate Once they do pass it they have to get right Trained instructor driver right minimum like 10 hours right And each phase the instructor rates them if they don't pass that phase Then they don't move on to the next module a lot of times most people don't pass it They spend like 80 hours Getting instructor lessons and it's like 50 Euros equivalent of like 60 bucks an hour. So imagine 60 bucks times 80 hours For some maybe 40 hours, whatever. It's ridiculous Like like no Norwegians are spending almost three thousand dollars to try to get a license these dudes They can't get licenses as kids most of the Norwegians. They're adults with jobs Before they can even get their license. It's crazy It's crazy when I tell them man shit you could graduate high school with a license <laughs> they look at me like 
Yo. In England, if you get one major, you fail the test. If you get one major, why? Take it or why? Yo, impatient fire. Sounds more like a pilot. Yeah, these guys act like they're flying 747s. Yo, I don't even think getting a light, a pilot license in America is this hard. Yo, yo. And they say U.S. is anti-consumer. Yo, it's crazy. Yo, we were all talking. Yo, the barber, she was like, she couldn't believe it. The reason why she was getting a motorcycle license, because again, it's also cheaper. And then getting a motorcycle saves on gas. I'm like, yo, it's crazy. And I'm thinking, damn, you really worry about gas? Yo, gas out here in Europe, yo, that shit's out of hand, right? So I paid for gas. There was one time I got gas in Germany without my military, because in the military, we have a deal with the German government. So we have this card. It's called, you know, SO. It's Exxon, but out here it's called SO. So if you guys are in Europe, you know the gas station I'm talking about, right? So here in Germany, the United States government has a deal with Germany and ESO that we pay American prices for gas, but it has to be specific at the ESO station and we have to have our specific card, right? So we load the money on the card and we pay for it and it comes out of the card, right? I didn't have money loaded on the card, so I had to pay the German price, right? To put this in perspective, to fill up my gas with premium, 14 gallon Nissan Maxima, it's around 55, 60 bucks. 60 bucks, let's say, right? So think about that, right? Even, you know, and that's like over $3 a gallon, right? So 60 bucks to fill up my tank. In Europe, because I had to pay the European, the German price, $135 to fill up my tank. A hundred and thirty five dollars. That's more than my insurance for the car. A hundred and thirty five dollars for that one time fill up without using the military rate. I was like, hey, yo, one hundred and thirty five dollars. Holy cow, if if gas in America was $135, we will we will start World War III ourselves. We we fight in all the oil guys. Any country where oil is not safe. Argentina, Venezuela, you got oil, we gunning for you. We ain't paying $135 to fill up a tank. That ain't happening in America. Everybody is getting guns and we're getting on a boat and we invading anybody. You got oil, you ain't safe. <laughs> we ain't paying a buck thirty-five. <laughs> Yo I was like Oh my god A hundred No wonder these, A lot of these cars You know Germany has A lot of these cars They're called smart Literally no trunk It's like the seat The wheel And the engine And that's the whole car <laughs> It's real tiny You can park that car anywhere Yo It blew I'm Like yo These dudes are ridiculous Like Yo I made sure that car was always loaded. I was like, I'm never doing this again. Even though I'm based, there's a base that has a gas station, you know, but I always make sure that car is loaded just in case I'm out in town and I got to get gas out in town. I'm not doing that. $130. Yo. That's insane. Yo, man, that's crazy. Um, not at the end, it's funny. Um, Cassie Cage, she says, laugh it out. They're trying to force people to stop driving because... You know, global warming. So in Germany, so you know, in, you know, in America, right? Winter. A lot of you who live in the states, that's winter, right? It snows. So what do you do? It's cold outside or really cold temperature. You get up in the morning. You go to your car. Some of you have automatic ignition, remote ignitions. So you turn on the car. Let that soaker warm up, right? You do what you do in the house. Brush your teeth. Eat breakfast. Go in. Now your car's all warmed up. It's defrosted. You drive off. You can't do that in Germany. A base, yeah, we do it. But on out in town, if you live out in town, you can't do that. You are not allowed to have your car on if you're not in it. And in Germany, it gets cold. It's cold. It's it's straight coal miners, asshole cold. Yo, for real, bro. Right? And you can't go outside and pre-warm your car? Oh hell nah. Oh hell nah. 
Luckily, I live on base. So when it's cold outside, oh, yeah, that, that shit's warming up. You know, people on base, you know. But out in town, and here's the crazy part. All right, Germans, y'all nosy. Germans are great people, but y'all nosy. Y'all, you guys couldn't live in America. They're nosy out in town, right? Like, they will be all up in your business. They will tell you. You need to mow your lawn. Like, I live on base, but I have friends that live out in town, and they tell me, like, the German neighbors, they're like, oh, how you doing? They're real nice. Oh, yeah, you know, your grass is kind of high, so make sure you mow it, but don't mow it on Sundays because that's quiet day. Yo, it's hilarious. Yo, it's hilarious. If you try to warm up your car, they'll call the police <laughs> on you. <laughs> so don't go warm up your car where you're not in it. Yo, but it's kind of a good thing because they're very attentive to their neighborhood. You know, so low crime rate, from what I noticed, very low crime. I don't know about Berlin, which is the biggest city, but in this area, you don't see a lot of vandalism, you know, so very low crime, very intuitive, very friendly neighbors. Um, a lot of, you know, my fellow co-workers that live out in town, they say when they move in, like the very next day or very that day, they're already knocking on their doors and the Germans are introducing themselves. Some of them bring German desserts. You know, they're very friendly. Welcome to the neighborhood. They help them. They explain stuff. They give them advice on how to, you know, take care of their lawn and stuff like that. Teach them about recycling and, you know, help them out. So very friendly and stuff like that. It's, it's crazy. Very good. Very good. You know, very, very traditional. Just very old school traditions in this country. Very old school traditions and stuff like that. Right. A lot of holidays. You guys are off all the time. All the time, right? Germans have a holiday for everything, right? They're always off, right? And the reason why I know is because on base, you know, some of the things like the barbershop, whatever, the cleaners is run by the Germans, right? If they have a German holiday, they're closed. The stuff run by Americans, obviously the fast food, Burger King, that's still open. The PX where you shop, that's still open. But everything else, if it's a German holiday, it's closed. And there's a lot of holidays. It's crazy. Oktoberfest, guys could drink. I mean, these guys can drink. Everybody's partying. There's always a party. You guys are always festival. And I love, I love just the, the culture. You know, there's this area in Stuttgart called the Schatzplatz. It's just a park, you know, with a water fountain. Sometimes they have festivals there, music, huge park, right? And people are just there. With blankets, whatever, picnic, drinking wine. And me and my wife did that a couple of times. On the summer, nice weather. We take the train, have a little basket, a bag, and we're just out there chilling. Everybody's, you see that a lot. You see a lot of the people just hanging out on the weekend, talking. It's, it's pretty cool. Um, um, stuff like that. Um, the food. Some of the food are delicious, right? Bratwurst. German bratwurst, obviously, delicious and stuff like that, right? The one thing I would say is you guys are very light on seasoning. They don't like to use a lot of seasoning, barely at all. Like, there's no pepper or salt on anything. Very light. You know, the steaks, good. You could tell fresh cuts of meat, but not a lot of seasoning on there. Very light. America, we like our seasonings, right? <coughs> so a lot of food, not a lot of seasonings, right? So I bring my little jar of my little thing of um, A1 sauce with me, right? Um, restaurant. <laughs> Listen, if you ever visit Europe and you go to a restaurant, do not expect American service. Don't. All right. This is pretty much it. You go into a restaurant, they seat you, they greet you. Right. Surprisingly, in Germany, a lot of Germans speak Spanish. Some speak, you know, a lot of English speakers here, but a lot of them speak Spanish. Like good, really good Spanish. So when we go to some of the places we go to, especially the restaurants, right? You see them little trouble English, but you know, real good people. But they look at us. Obviously, I stick out like a sore thumb as a Latino, me and my wife, and they ask, "Do you speak Spanish?" You know, and we tell them in Spanish that yeah, we speak Spanish, and they just blurt it out. Because it's easier for them to talk Spanish than English. And we're like, holy cow. Like, German dude, female, they're German. No doubt about it. But they're speaking Spanish like if they were raised in Spain. Crazy, right? 
So you sit down in a restaurant, right? They come, they give you a meal. Many places have American menu because, you know, English, English and American tourists. So they have English menu, very accommodating to English culture. You know, it's really good, right? English menu. And they'd be like, oh, would you like something to drink now or whatever? Yeah, we'll have, you know, I usually get my soda, diet soda, whatever. My wife might get a wine, whatever. Cool. They bring the drink. They leave. We look through our menu. We order the food. They come back, right? What would you like to order? We order our food, break it down, whatever, whatever. They leave. We're enjoying our drink. They don't serve ice with the drinks either. It's just like you have to ask for it. But by default, no ice on any drinks, right? So you got your drink. You're waiting. They deliver your food, whatever. Depending on your food, they might check if it's cooked right. You know, like steak. You know, you ask for medium just to make sure they got it, right? Once you get your food, they're not coming back. You're not seeing them again until you finish your plate. There's no free refills. There's none of that. You're not seeing them ever again. Just enjoy your food. Take your time. They're not rushing because they don't work on tips. They don't even get tips. They, they get full salary. It's not like America where it's half, you know, you, you work under minimum wage and waitress, they make their money through tips. No, they don't need tips. They out. They ain't coming back. When they do come back is when they see your plates are empty because they're going to ask if you want dessert and coffee. If you don't want dessert and coffee, that's it. Pay your shit, you're done. That's it. <laughs> it's over. The night's over. Enjoy. You're going to get your food even if it's a big table. They're not going to come back and be like, oh, do you need more drinks? Uh, you know, yeah, no, 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 no. Hey, no, no, you ain't getting more drinks. You're done. All right? Unless it's beer, yeah, they'll make sure, you know, keep the beer coming. But soda ain't no free refills. If you if you drink all your soda and you really want another soda, you're buying it. And you really have to get their attention. And most of the time they're thinking, is something wrong? Because to them, most people don't drink more than one glass of soda. You know? It's rare for them. It's rare for Europeans to drink a lot of soda. America, we slushing them shits down. That's why we have free refills. Keep them shits coming. We're drinking like 3,000 calories in just Pepsi. Right? 3,000 calories of Pepsi alone. But to them, you know, you drink one glass. You know, like they, That's why a lot of them are slim. They don't drink four or five glasses of Pepsi. That one glass is what they're going to have. If they drink anything else, it's going to be like water or beer or whatever, right? So normally to them, it's normal just to have the one thing. So the first time I did that, I'm like, hey, uh, can I get another soda? And they look at me like, oh, you want another one? I go, okay. And they add that to the bill. It's funny, but they ain't coming back. Once you're done eating and they see you're done eating, they assume you're going to do the dessert and coffee thing. And they'll cater to that. Right? And sometimes I have a dessert, depending on the place, coffee, and then that's it. There's the check, right? I do tip them anyway, you know, even though they don't need it because they get full salary, full benefits. It's a job. You know, they get full everything, right? But I do appreciate because they're kind. I like how they accommodate to my language. They accommodate to English because I'm in their country, right? You know, in America, you get a foreign guy, we'd be like, speak English, you know, we're rude, but over them, very accommodating, you know, they help us out with the menu. If they speak Spanish, they have no problem speaking Spanish. It's a, it's a very, you know, and I appreciate that. So we do tip them anyway. It's just a thing. You know, we appreciate what they do. There's one spot that we go a lot, Tower 66. That was the first person we met that was German but spoke Spanish. Two people spoke Spanish. The one behind the bar is a dude, but it's because he says he lived in Spain for a while. And then another German woman, she's a waitress. She speaks good Spanish, whatever. They know us because we go there all the time, right? But they're amazing people, and we always tip them great, whatever. Even though, you know, they even told us, you don't have to tip. We get regular pay, but we still do it anyway, right? But I'm going to tell you, and that's not just Germany. It's all over Europe. Italy's the same way. Once you get your food, so Italy's different too. So this is what I learned. And it confused the hell out of me and Chastity, right? Yeah, they speak the Spanish version of Spain, yeah. They don't speak the Caribbean shit we speak, right? Because when me and Stas just talk in Spanish, they ask us, where are you from? Because they know we're not from Spain, and we say our family's from Puerto Rico, so it's a different dialect. And they laugh, and they find it, you know, they find it funny, as in amusing, on how we speak Spanish, whatever, right? <clears throat> 
So in Italy, and this confused the hell out of us. I had no idea about this, right? But Italy, obviously, you don't have their coarse meals, right? That's traditional. We know about Italians about that. You know, you got your appetizer, you got your meal, you got your appetizer, you got your salad, or you got your appetizer, right? Little snacks, you know, Italian bread and vinegar, you know, and olive oil and all that stuff, right? You got your soup, you got your meal, you got your dessert. And coffee, right? But I learned that from American Italians in New York. Cool. Italy, you got your initial appetizers, you know, you got your bread, Italian bread, olive oil, whatever. They're going to give you your soup if you order it, right? Then you got the first meal. It's the first meal, right? Which is spaghetti, some type of tomato sauce, something, you know, some type of noodle dish, Right? And then you got the second meal, which is like the meat and big stuff. You know, steak, Italian sausage, seafood, whatever. So it's two meals. And then the stuff. And the reason why it confused the hell out of us, because chassis, like in New York, you could get, you know, spaghetti with Italian sausage combined. They sell it like that, right? They didn't sell it like that in Italy. Like, you didn't get that in Italy. Like, you cannot get... You know, spaghetti with Italian sausage Because the sausage is the second meal Right? So what my wife did was I want the first meal and the second meal at the same time So she wants the spaghetti dish And she wants the Italian sausage dish And when they brought both She would combine it and chop it up and combine it (laughs) Yo Oh my god Yo, it's crazy Oh, snap You know Me When I was in Italy I don't know why I always got the pizza Right. And what's funny is, oh, this is a true, true story. Right. And some of you in Italians in Italy, you could back me up on this. Right. So we so we go to Rome. Right. When not really Rome, but we go to Rome, whatever. So the first night there, we get there. We land in the airport. We got there in the afternoon, like at, you know, 6 p.m., whatever. So we just went to the hotel room and I started battle planning. You know, I'm in the military, so I got to do my battle plan. I got to do my battle plan. This is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to visit. We're going to go to Coliseum tomorrow, whatever. But we wanted to eat at a restaurant that night, right? Of course, I'm not going to go to the tourist restaurants. So I go to Yelp, look up. I'm looking for all the mom and pop restaurants. I want mom and pop Italian food, right? So we found this one place and, you know, call me crazy, but it's the hood. We, we, me and Chas know when we're in the hood. We know. You know a hood when you look at it. When you're in the neighborhood, there's not a lot of lights. People are hanging their clothes from one building to the other, right? You know the hood. You could tell, right? So we're in the hood. But the restaurant got like 4.7 stars out of like 8,000 people. So this is this is mom and pop, right? Mom and pop stuff, straight up, right? The food is delicious though, right? So my wife, that's where we did the whole, that's where she did the whole Italian sausage combined thing, right? I ordered a pizza because Italian pizza is just amazing, right? But when they serve it to me, it was one whole pizza, not cut up like in New York. You know, New York, you get slices. This whole pizza is not cut up and they gave me a knife and fork. So I got this whole pizza And knife and fork. And I'm like, and it's not cut up in slices. There's, there's no slice. It's just one whole pizza. And I'm like, like, am I? And then I'm looking around the restaurant, and other people order pizza. But they're not eating it with their hands. They're literally taking the knife and fork, cutting the pizza up, and eating it like that. They're not, like, if you're from New York or in America, you, eat, you know, you cut it in a triangle, fold it, and you eat that sucker. They're not doing that in this restaurant. So as the saying goes, when in Rome, do as the Romans do, right? I was about to grab that hand. My wife, like, I don't think you need to do that because they're going to be staring at you, right? I was this close to doing it because you see me, I cut like a big slice, right? And then I put my hand on it, and I was like folding it. And then I noticed people were like looking at me, like some. Like, you can feel it. You know. So I put my hand back and grab the fork again. And I just cut in pieces and I'm eating. First time I ever ate a pizza with knife and fork. 
It was still good, though. But it was just weird. And everybody was like that. Everybody ordered pizza, ate it with a knife and fork, right? And then I asked the lady, you know, because we're from New York, and she, you know, and she was, she was an amazing waitress, right? Um, and we just asked her, I'm like, is it customary to eat pizza? And he goes, yeah, like, like, and we told her, oh, we're from New York. And she's like, oh, yeah, you guys eat your pizza like savages. <laughs> Yo, that's what she said. Oh my God! No, oh, me and my wife start laughing. She's like, "Oh yeah, you, we heard you guys in New York. Yeah, you eat your pizzas like savages over there." We were like, <laughs> "She's like, oh, I didn't mean to be insulting, but yeah, you don't eat pizza with your hands." We're like, "Oh man, oh my God, yo!" I was like, "Yo, <laughs> yo, she, yo!" Like Italians probably look at people in New York like cavemen and stuff. Yo, oh. Uh, Oh, I was like, I found it funny because she was so sweet and nice, you know. But she's like, yeah, you don't eat pizza with your hands. It's, you know, food. And then, you know, after she left, right, my wife's like, clearly somebody never went to Kentucky Fried Chicken. I was, I was like, Chaz. <laughs> I'm like, Chaz. <laughs> Yo. Yo, it was tough, man. It was, yo, it was crazy, yo. But it's just different cultures, just, just different things that, that you learn and stuff. And stuff. Germany, they don't have that here. Germany, you buy a pizza, you can eat it with your hands. And I never had that issue here. Uh, um, I never had an issue with that here, right? I ate it with your hands and stuff like that. Um, but Italy, yo, I was like, you know, and I, I swear to God I was going to eat that, you know, because I cut it. I took the knife and I cut it in triangles. I'm like, yeah, we're going to do our do. But once I put my hand like this and I folded it, you just felt. And I'm looking around. Some people stop eating. Like, you could tell they're pretending. Like, you could tell they're like, uh, and they're looking at me. But, but they're pretending they're looking at me. And I said, you know what? I said, and, then I said, and then everything went normal. Oh, yeah. Exactly. You know, you fold that sucker up, you be like, mm, you know, you got the cheese, you know, it's, I don't know, man, but it's delicious. And they drizzle, they drizzle olive oil on it. That's, that's something new. You don't see that in New York a lot. It's really good. You know, they, they really, they really take pride in their food. Their food is delicious and stuff like that. Um, it's crazy, man. It's, it's just, uh, oh man, it's just different, man. No way I've been to, man, no way, like I cannot stand seafood. I don't eat fish. I don't eat seafood. But goddamn, no way y'all eat seafood. Wow, bro. Y'all eat that all day. Italians do in Italy. But, man, I cannot stand seafood. It makes me want to throw up. I'm like, huh? I'm like, oh, my God, no way. They, they live on that stuff. And then I was in this uh, hotel in Norway, the Bardu Hotel. Nice hotel. Very comfy. Heated floors, especially the bathroom. I really like that. I want to do that in my house, right? They have like reindeer stew. Like they eat reindeer up there. Like y'all eat reindeer. Who the hell eats Rudolph? Like, you know, like I saw on a menu. And it was a very limited menu. A lot of fish. Then I saw this. I'm like, what's this? Oh, that's reindeer stew. I'm like, reindeer? Like, you actually eat reindeer? They're like, yeah. And I'm thinking in my head, he eating Rudolph. Like, yeah, yeah, eat Rudolph? Like, well, how can you do that? And then I saw Swedish meatballs. I'm like, yeah, I'll have the Swedish meatballs. <laughs> um, somebody put in the chat, reindeer's fire. I'm not lying. They eat reindeer up there, dog. They eat some reindeer, boy. They chopping that sucker up. I I didn't taste it. You can't front like it ain't good either. I did not taste it. Uh, I you know what I'm saying? I just leave it alone. Okay. I guess it's venice. I mean deer, I know people eat deer, but this is reindeer. This root, I don't know, man. You think of reindeer, you think of Christmas, and you know, the reindeer's going down the street pulling. You know, Santa sleigh. I didn't think y'all eat the motherfucker. You know, after they pulled the sleigh. That's just wrong. You know what I'm saying? 
I'm just saying. You know, <laughs> it's just a weird thing. Man, you know what? I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to have a podcast and just do a... Before I leave, you know, because obviously eventually, you know, I have to move out of here. Internet's going to shut down. I think I'm going to do one last podcast and do my, like, European review and just talk about all that stuff, right? But anyway, with that said, yo, I truly appreciate you guys rocking out with me. Um, It's 9.50 over here, so I definitely want to get in some gaming time. But I appreciate you supporting the channel. Hit the like button. Retweet it to your favorite. If you're new to the channel... I hope you enjoy the content. Like and subscribe. This is your boy Porter Rock 77. And I'm about to end this stream. And I'm about to play some Death Stranding. And I'm going to deliver these packages. Because somebody got to do it. <laughs> All right, y'all take care. Peace.